here. Uh, hello and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Brian Aylward. I am the AVP for the Office of Academic Innovation, Operations and Technology here with UAGC. I'll be the host for your session, uh, providing room to grow, helping students overcome feedback, feedback anxiety. Uh, by joining us today, you acknowledge that this session is being recorded and will be shared with TLC related materials. Microphones will be muted for this presentation, but we encourage you to post questions and comments in the chat. Also, we have enabled live transcription. If you would like to use it, click on the live transcription button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Now I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Kara Metz, who is a program chair here with UAGC in the College of Health, Human Services and Sciences. And I'll pass things over to Kara now. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I am Dr. Kara Metz. I am a professor here and I am the chair for the Bachelors of Health and Human Services. Um, and my background is in counseling. So I have some of those aspects in here. We're gonna learn a little bit about the brain and we're gonna learn some uh, tips and tools you can provide for your students when uh, do, helping them get acquainted to feedback. So let's talk about dopamine and the five star effect. So as a society, we have gone from where there was scarcity to a place where we have an overwhelming abundance. Drugs, food, news, shopping, gaming, gambling, texting, social media, -ing, YouTubing, we're bombarded with highly rewarded stimuli on a regular basis. And this activates our dopamine or that pleasure center of our brain. And we love this. Um, if you can imagine, if you're picking out a place to eat, are you going to go for the place with five stars? Or are you going to go to the place with three stars? Our brains are almost hardwired to, to think that, you know, only five stars is good enough. Um, think about um, those sites. Forgive me, I don't use them. Um, where you stay in other people's houses or transport Ubering. That's one of the things that you can do. Those things, if if you're not a five star, then um, I've heard that it's just awful if you don't get five stars. So can you imagine coming into a classroom where you're not constantly getting five stars on everything um, and the impact that has and it's not stimulating that dopamine level, it can be a little intimidating. So let's talk about why feedback is hard to receive. So we're going to uh, look at the brain a little bit. So some of this uh, is due to our past. Maybe we've had past experiences where uh, people haven't been kind when giving feedback, they've been exceptionally harsh, or it's meant something bad. You've had feedback at a job and then suddenly they're, you're losing it. You're put on a pip or something along those lines. And also realizing that everybody's brain reacts a little bit differently to feedback. So let's, let's get into our heads a little bit. So we have the amygdala and the amygdala activates our fight or flight, fawn or freeze response. Frontal cortex, this is the area that integrates the emotional response with the contents of the feedback. And then there's the prefrontal cortex where uh, we make decisions and judgments about a situation. And then we have two sides. We have the left side, which is responsible for our positive goals and our positive emotions, such as love, hope, and amusement. And then we have the right side, which is responsible for avoidance and negative emotions. When we receive feedback, all of these areas are activated and influence how we react to feedback. So if the amygdala matches a current situation with something in the past that elicited fear, our body starts to activate an alarm and we go on red alert. Unfortunately, what we lack as humans is an everything is fine and green alert. So we react when we see patterns of fear, which make emotionally stressful situations have an even bigger impact. Our students come from all sorts of situations. Um, they have had experiences with feedback and trauma and anxiety, so on. So it can be important to understand the impact of how our current feedback 
um, has on them. So the amygdala sends up the alert. Then the prefrontal cortex takes over and can intensify feelings um, that the amygdala started. So it can kind of act as an antagonist. So when an alert goes up, our right side takes over and intensifies those feelings. Although we have the left side that tries to pipe in and tell the right side um, to calm down and um, be a little bit stronger, um, if the if that side is stronger, we can quickly put out the um, fire that was um, started by that spark. So let's look at this another way. We might approach reading feedback or uh, seeing critical feedback and our amygdala, starts, our amygdala starts yelling, danger, danger. Our right prefrontal cortex agrees and says, yep, this is an absolute disaster. At the same time, our prefrontal cortex is saying, hey y'all, it is not that bad, let's calm down. You can also receive positive feedback. It is not all bad, you are not bad, and we can grow from this. Now, everyone has different volumes of our prefrontal cortex's halves. Um, so at an open university, we often see non-traditional students. And so we don't know which side is louder. And the goal of us as instructors is to help our students turn up the volume of the left side so that when they see feedback, they're not saying danger, danger, but actually saying, this is a good thing. This is positive for us. This can help us grow. And then I'm a counselor, so I'm going to bring a little counseling techniques in here. Um, call this the ABCs. So it kind of is in line with the story that I told about the brain. You have the activating events, which is you getting a paper back. Maybe the paper is a B um, or a C, or maybe it is an A minus. Um, oh my goodness, we've done something wrong, right? Um, then the behavior might be, well, I don't wanna know what I do did wrong. I don't, I don't want to be reminded of how imperfect I am. And then the consequence is that we don't read the feedback and we make the same mistakes in further papers. Between your activating event A and the behavior, there are thoughts and feelings. Um, and so these might be self-defeating thoughts, like you're terrible. Um, you're making so many mistakes. It's not even worth looking at it. Um, it's just gonna bring you down. You don't wanna ruin your weekend, uh, which then is gonna lead to your behavior, but you can start to change those thoughts and you want to change those thoughts into telling yourself that feedback is good and it's how we grow and I am here now, but that doesn't mean I, that I have to stay at this place by the end of the term. So I'm gonna tell you a little story about feedback and you are welcome to laugh. You are welcome to roll my uh, your eyes at me and say, oh my goodness, I cannot believe that you actually thought this. That is fine. Um, that's part of the point of the story. Many years ago, I was invited to go snowboarding um, on the East Coast in the mountains um, in New England. Uh, they're very icy. Snowboarding is nearly impossible, especially for someone who is just learning. Uh, so before I was a doc student and I love researching, and this is the time before YouTube. Uh, so I, I looked online, I Googled it, and I started reading about how to snowboard, right? And so it talks about, you know, how you go down the hill and you wanna do this S and ways to move your body. So by the time I got to the slope and I got to the top of the mountain, I felt prepared. I was going to do amazing. I was just gonna pick up snowboarding so easily. You can imagine how that went. Um, although I had read about snowboarding, I'd never actually done snowboarding and, figuring out how to maneuver my body and maneuver the snowboard and the, the speed that I was going, there were, there were lots of different factors that I had not anticipated. Um, I was not very good. Luckily I had a friend who was very good at snowboarding and she helped me a little bit. And by the end, 
I wasn't snowboarding through flaming hoops. I actually still wasn't that great, but I was better than before. And I tell this story because our students come from all different backgrounds. We work for an open university. They might not have written a paper in years. Uh, they might not even remember how to do it. They might not have written anything formal ever. And yet we get into a class and we're asking them to do these things from day one. We might give them instructions or an example, but just like me going onto a mountain, think I can snowboard just because I've read about it. It's the same thing with our students. Just because they have read about how to do these things doesn't mean they're gonna be good at it right away. It takes practice, it takes feedback, it takes um, input from instructors. So how do we move students towards embracing that feedback? These are things that you should do as you are starting class. You want to help instruct students how to embrace feedback. It's not gonna be something that they want to do right away. So um, you can talk to them about preparing themselves, asking them how they're feeling right now so that they can start to manage those emotions before they read the paper. So if they're getting very anxious before reading feedback on a paper, they might need to take a step back, do some deep breathing, and then continue on when they feel like they're in a better place. Um, under, having self-talk, we want to be very positive. So replacing those thought, those negative thoughts of what feedback means to something more positive. Um, in therapy, sometimes I will have students or clients make lists and on one side, they list all of their anxious thoughts about, in this case, feedback. And on the right side, they would list all of the reality statements. So um, their anxiety statement might be, I am terrible, I can't believe I didn't know this. And in reality is, this is a place for me to grow. This is going to help me get to my goal. This is going to help me become a better student. You can do self-talk in a mirror. I know that sounds silly. There's, there's a Saturday Night Live sketch all about it, and I laugh also at it. But thinking about it, if you're looking at someone and you want to lie, you typically don't look in, in the eyes. You kind of try to avert away. This is the same thing. So if you start telling yourself these positive thoughts in a mirror, you are good enough. You, this is a learning process. The feedback is going to help you grow. You'll start to believe it because you're looking at yourself, you're looking yourself in the eye, and this can be a really effective thing. Also separating the feelings, the story, and the feedback. So asking yourself, how are you feeling about the feedback? What is the um, purpose of the instructor giving you the feedback? And then what is the actual feedback? So immediately you might ask yourself how you feel about the feedback and you might, a student might say, this is, this is terrible. I don't believe any of this, this is crap. They, you know, they might have all these negative feel feelings about the instructor. They might have negative feelings about themselves. And that's fine. And you really do. You need to get those feelings out. You need to acknowledge them because they're important to have. We don't want to ignore them. But once we've gotten them out, we need to take a step back and we need to start to reframe our thinking. Why am I receiving this feedback? And once we can separate ourselves from those emotions, we can actually hear what the instructor is saying. And this is also another way to change your perspective on things. Another way is teaching students how to adopt a growth identity, that we are works in progress. No one ever is perfect. I give the example in classes that um, I was asked to review a chapter for a person, an author that had written many books. He's very respected within the profession. And I was asked to read this book chapter to review it for him. And I read it and you know what? I found mistakes. I found wordings that I felt uncomfortable with. I found 
APA errors. I found writing errors. And I share this example to let students know, even the professionals, the people that do this for a living, make mistakes. They need help and they need feedback. This isn't something to punish people, but it's a way to make people better. And we're never perfect. And then with time, it becomes easier. So sometimes I even share an example of my own experiences with this. Um, a lot of times I'll talk about a story where I was in my master's and I was at my first internship and um, my program was great. I have lots of praise for it. I learned so much. But when it comes to documentation, I heard, you know, document, document, document. If it isn't documented, it didn't happen, as well as anyone can sue you at any time for any reason, right? So I go into my first session and I finish the session and I get this note and it has instructions on the top. And I write down every single thing that was said and happened during the session. And I did this for a few sessions. I come back the next day. I look in my mailbox and I get all of my notes back and they have all these sticky notes on them with this feedback um, about how I did it wrong. And I collected my things, walked up to my office, closed my door and cried. And this happened, you know, over several months. But after about six months, I stopped receiving the sticky notes. I was even asked to train the new interns as they came in. So this is a story about progress, right? And so we might receive feedback when first doing things and it might be a lot and it might feel overwhelming, but we will improve and we will move forward. So that's teaching. You wanna teach your students how to embrace feedback, but we can also help them embrace feedback. So we want to encourage students to form support groups with others in the same program, form that camaraderie um, amongst them because that, that's a sense of safety. Um, they can get things off their chest, they can make complaints, but they can also share their own successes or what feedback has meant to them. Start to build a relationship with students take it one step at a time. If students trust you, if students feel as though you care about them, students will read the feedback. Students will know that you are not there just to point out their mistakes or tell them how terrible they are. You are there to help them grow. You are there to help them succeed, um, not only in the class, but in the program. Um, so that's another way, building that relationship. If you've heard me talk, you've probably heard me say the relationship is the most important thing in the growth process. And so if we're going to help our students grow and succeed, we have to build those strong foundational relationships with them. When we're giving feedback, be meaningful. Don't just fire off, um, you know, feedback, make sure that there's a purpose, make sure that you are providing an explanation. Um, you know, sometimes my feedback is just telling them more about the subject because I get excited based on what they wrote. Or I will talk about how um, what I'm asking them to do is meaningful because it'll help them in certain ways, whether it's within their career or within the rest of the program. You want to provide specific and individual feedback. Um, so don't just copy and paste this, the same feedback to every student or maybe change it up a little bit. Make sure that if you're taking off points, you're explaining why. Um, being very specific so that students can use that feedback to help them grow and not just have a negative outlook on what they're receiving or just think that they were bad in what they did. Also, when you're before making a comment, asking yourself, how will this help my student in the future? If you can start to frame why you're giving the feedback and how you're giving the feedback, students will be able to use that more effectively. Um, I talked about sharing your own experiences. I shared an experience with my sticky note. 
uh, story and um, I share that I cry. I share that I'm vulnerable. Um, and that feedback is hard sometimes, especially at first when you're receiving it, but it gets easier with time. Going through a an academic program, regardless of the age, but especially at an open university, is a very vulnerable process. A person opens themselves up. And so we have to be careful with our students and their vulnerability. We want to make sure that we show that it's okay to be vulnerable. We want to be sure to um, also show that we will care for them within that vulnerable state. Having a quick turnaround, studies have shown that the quicker that students receive feedback, the more effective it is. So if students are having to wait a very long time and most universities have um, a set limit that is you know, the day before or they have a week to get it in. I have um, been an adjunct at a university where I had three days to get the feedback. But what that provided was very a very quick turnaround that students didn't have time to build up their anxiety about it or forget about the assignment. And so having a quick turnaround with that specific feedback is very important to students being able to embrace it. And finally, acknowledging efforts. Positive feedback works better than negative feedback. Uh, there's lots of uh, research on this. Uh, I use this a lot when I'm with uh, parents and talking about parenting, about how positive feedback and praise works so much better than negativity or, or pointing out when people are doing things wrong. It's important to have a balance because that's how we help our students, but trying to come from a strengths-based perspective and trying to understand how can we use uh, the, the students' strengths to be able to help them um, improve in areas that are not as strong. So with that, I hope that students can go from feeling overwhelmed and dreading what is on the left to being able to say thank you for the feedback and accept the change that the feedback provides. So I am ready for any questions or um, comments from anybody. Looks like there's a question in the chat, Kara. If you'll read that. Okay. Any suggestions for providing feedback to professionals, colleagues, faculty, experts, et cetera? Do your feedback strategies change based on their receiver or target audience? Honestly, my feedback doesn't change. Um, it might change on the level of the things that I am looking at, but overall, feedback is a vulnerable process. So I want people to feel safe. I want them to be able to um, know that I'm coming from a place of caring and I'm wanting them to grow from the feedback. It's not just being nitpicky or something along those lines. Um, there are other questions. I love, um, sorry, Felicia, uh, your idea of um, providing an example from previous students. I think that is a great suggestion. It's also a reference on, on how to, to do it, how to follow through with the assignment. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Looks like Ali Weber asked a question there uh, where students tend to feel like feedback is an attack and wants to know how we can help in uh, advising change that state of mind. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And that's, you know, where I talk about the purpose of feedback. Um, I talk about being able to sit with those negative emotions at first because you're it, it, you see it as an attack because that's what your brain is telling you. That's an automatic response. It's gonna take time for your brain to start to change how it thinks about feedback and that's okay. 
Um, so starting to frame feedback as a growth process, um, how it can help you feel better. Like I said, making a list of those negative emotions and on the left and on the right, writing the positive truth so that before maybe a student looks at the feedback, they can look at that list and see what the truth is. Um, I always say, put it in your hand, own handwriting. Don't type it on a computer because if you see it in your own handwriting, you know that you have believed it at some point. So that's another suggestion for um, how to do that. But it's a lot of coaching and training and just being supportive to the students and acknowledging this feedback is hard. Um, it's hard for everybody. Let's see, how do you suggest providing feedback to students versus faculty versus students when there is a is room for positive opportunities for improvement? Um, I think with when there's always positive opportunities for improvement, and that's where I really feel like when you lean on students or faculty strengths and then help them see how they can use those strengths to um, elevate other areas, and I try to use very positive language too. Um, so for example, if, uh, so let's say a student wrote an introductory paragraph and then um, they didn't have a thesis statement. I might say, you know, a sentence at the end where you kind of outline the paper would really elevate your entire introduction and make it perfect, right? So trying to be very positive with uh, my comments and, and use positive language instead of a deficit language. Yep, and we all fear feedback. I think um, Debbie Carpenter made a really good comment there in the chat for those of you who are following along. And, uh, she uses the phrase, feedback is a gift. Uh, and thank you for embracing the gift of feedback or my gift of feedback, which I think is a, really powerful statement for changing somebody's perspective on, on feedback and, and being more receptive to it. I love that. I love, I, I love the word embrace. Um, I think that uh, it provides a really powerful visual. I'm like seeing a person hugging feedback. <laughs> um, but I think that's a, a really important that we just like envelop the feedback to help us grow. I love that. Thank you. I think a student, uh, how receptive a student is to feedback is really determined by how the early on in their educational experience and kind of what that feedback's looked like and, and how they were able to implement it in some of their, their uh, practices as a student. So I, I think, especially early on in the student's educational journey, if they get strong feedback and, and strong teachers and support, it will help them later on to be able to embrace it. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I've started to include in assignments um, asking students about how they use their feedback so that they're getting into the habit of going back and checking. But that has to be something that students are taught from the very beginning. Like I said, we don't know their backgrounds or the impact that feedback has had on them. Some people could have some really troubling experiences and uh, we do have to be there for them and embrace that and embrace them um, and then work with them on how to overcome that. We can't just expect students to know how to do that. Um, they have they have to be taught just like with everything else. Again, it's, it's just like me try, thinking I can snowboard from reading directions online. I know we're coming up on time here. I don't know if anybody has any last second uh, questions or comments they want to make. Um, Felicia talks about the uh, the sandwich method for uh, feedback delivery as well, which I think we're mm -hmm. all familiar with. That's a great idea. All right. Well, I am going to once again post the link for uh, the evaluation form in the chat. Uh, please take the opportunity to look to uh, fill that out. So uh, just closing things out here. So thank you, uh, Kara, for a great presentation. I uh, absolutely loved it. Uh, and thank you to the audience for your participation uh, in today's session. Please use the survey linked uh, in the chat to nominate TLC presentations for conference awards and share your feedback on your conference experience. Um, again, thank you all for taking the opportunity to attend today. And Kara, thanks again for a, a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much.